let's send you right now to Milwaukee Police Headquarters where they are giving an update on the stolen Stradivarius. Well, good afternoon. I'm Mayor Tom Barrett, and I'm joined this afternoon by uh, Chief Edward Flynn from the Milwaukee Police Department, uh, John Chisholm, the Milwaukee County District Attorney, G.B. Jones, the Acting Special Agent in Charge of the Milwaukee Division of the FBI, Mark Niehaus, the President of the Milwaukee Symphony Orchestra, um, and some wonderful men and women who are involved with the Milwaukee Police Department and the FBI who have been involved in this very, very gratifying experience. Um, there are good days and there are bad days. Uh, today is a good day. Thanks to the incredible work that was done by the Milwaukee Police Department, by the FBI, by the District Attorney's Office, and importantly, by citizens who utilized our tip line and gave tips not only to the Police Department, but to the Milwaukee Symphony, um, we are here to announce that the violin that was seized several weeks ago has now been recovered. This is a wonderful, wonderful day for the Milwaukee Symphony, for the Milwaukee Police Department, for the FBI, for the District Attorney, uh, and for the citizens of this city. I want to give credit um, to all law enforcement officials who were involved in this effort. It was a co-op, it was a model of cooperation, uh, where the FBI, working closely with the Police Department and ultimately the District Attorney's Office, um, were able to utilize information that they received, that they uncovered, um, and allowed them not only to apprehend the three suspects in this case, but equally important to recover this priceless violin. Um, so I would now like, again, to congratulate Chief Lynn and the men and women who work for his department who have done just outstanding work. And, and I would point out that this is the second time in less than a month that we have had an occasion like this. It was several weeks ago where we learned that the police department, uh, through some excellent police work, were able to end the saga that the city had with the missing Dynacare flash drive. Um, but it is work that is done like this every single day by the Milwaukee Police Department. Not often high profile like it is here today. But the men and women of the Milwaukee Police Department, as well as the FBI and the District Attorney's Office, perform yeoman's efforts um, to investigate and solve crimes and prevent crimes in this community. Chief Lynn, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, today the Milwaukee Police Department is pleased and very proud to announce the safe recovery of the Lipinski Stradivarius violin that was stolen January 27th. Its safe return is the result of hard work by many members of this agency and their partners in other agencies, as well as the engagement of an active citizenry that provided information that would later prove important to the successful resolution of this investigation. I'm gonna give you a brief timeline of our investigation before turning the podium over to District Attorney John Chisholm, who will discuss charging decisions. On January 27th, as you recall, two individuals used an electronic control device commonly referred to as a taser to rob concertmaster Frank Almond of his 1715 Lipinski Stradivarius violin. Obviously, this is a shocking crime, literally and figuratively, to the community. The Milwaukee Police Department immediately initiated an investigation into this crime and contacted the FBI's arts crimes team for advice on the ramification of this, of this crime and possible uh, destinations for such a valuable artifact. Our investigation and tips we received led us to an individual here in Milwaukee. We worked very closely with Taser International who provided us invaluable information that the FBI was able to track down for us in Texas. That information led us to an individual who had purchased this device. His name is Universal Knowledge Allah. He was placed under arrest. An independent anonymous tip several days into the investigation identified a primary suspect in this theft, Salah Ibn Jones. 
Now, the Milwaukee Police Department conducted an investigation and surveillance into both individuals. This investigation and surveillance led to our receiving permission to conduct five separate search warrants. These uh, search warrants were uh, executed, and those uh, search warrants resulted in the arrests of three individuals. Subsequent to those arrests, as the result of our continued investigations and interviews, information was received that indicated the location of this violin. Another search warrant was applied for and received and executed on East Smith Street. This search warrant was served last night, and this search warrant revealed the Stradivarius violin secreted in a suitcase stored in the attic of the residence. It has been safely recovered, and later today, it is our expectation it will be returned to its owner. Now, I want to specifically commend several individuals. Now, this is always risky because so many people were involved in this investigation, but I want to make sure that special recognition is given to members of the Milwaukee Police Department under the command of Captain Jeffrey Point, specifically Police Officer Will Schroeder, Detectives Eric Donaldson, Bill Ball, and Gus Petropoulos all played critical roles in this investigation. We also want to commend FBI agents Tim Bizworm and Dave Bass for their advice and assistance as we conducted this investigation. Um, obviously now, the process has to continue to move. The next step in the process is, char is charging and then adjudication. And I will now turn the uh, podium over to the uh, District Attorney for the County of Milwaukee, John Chisholm. John? Thank you very much, Chief, and congratulations go to the Milwaukee Police Department and to the FBI. Um, we have worked closely with them. I assigned Assistant District Attorney David Robles to work with the Milwaukee Police Department and the FBI early on in the investigation. Uh, he received substantial assistance during the investigation from Assistant DA Grant Hubner, who's currently assigned to the Homicide Unit. Um, this has been a lengthy process. Um, it was not resolved, quite frankly, through both investigation and through negotiation until later last night. Um, as a result, a criminal complaint related to this matter is not available at this time, but I anticipate that we will be providing you a criminal complaint uh, early tomorrow morning. Um, and again, that, that's a function of the fact that uh, ADA Robles, who will be handling the case, um, was directly involved in both the investigation and uh, the negotiations that led to the recovery uh, of the violin. Obviously, we have to balance a lot of different things. Before resolving this case, uh, we consulted closely with the victim of the case, the owner of the violin. Uh, the community has a strong interest and accountability with respect to this as well. Uh, we understand that. We also understood the uh, tremendous uh, incentive and concern related to this invaluable piece of art. And we were also concerned about uh, making sure we recovered it as quickly as possible so that no damage occurred to it. Uh, so it was a complicated process. Uh, it's still ongoing. But as I indicated, I anticipate uh, that you will receive uh, additional information related to our charges tomorrow. Uh, it will relate to a felony count of robbery and uh, we'll provide additional details at, at that point in time. Obviously, the suspect is presumed innocent uh, until the conclusion of all of these uh, proceedings. But uh, again, I want to congratulate the Milwaukee Police Department, uh, express uh, my, my um, deep concern for the victim in the case. Um, this has obviously been a traumatic experience. We'll continue to work closely with them. Uh, our understanding is that they're, they're um, obviously relieved that, that this is the resolution, and we'll continue to work closely with them uh, as this prosecution continues and unfolds. Uh, but again, we could not have done this without, again, the invaluable assistance of our federal partners. Again, there's nothing unusual about that. We work with them uh, on a daily basis. And uh, in order to address that issue, I'd like to turn it over to Special Agent G.B. Jones. Thank you, John. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for coming here to celebrate with us uh, the thrill of this victory. Uh, this 
really is a tale of collaboration. It is the work of the Milwaukee Police Department, principally assisted by the FBI and the District Attorney's Office, and importantly, assisted wholeheartedly by the Milwaukee Symphony Orchestra. Uh, this public-private partnership really is what enabled this full investigation to unfold. We got uh, absolute transparency in what it was we were dealing with, uh, both on the private level as well as the public level. And, and the result is today that when we sit down and, and look at all of the collaboration, all of the work uh, that was done in this case, uh, we're able to, to say jointly uh, what a great success it was. Uh, the chief has already recognized several members of the police department uh, and a couple of FBI agents. Uh, our lead uh, manager in this case was Robert Botch, the supervisory special agent of the Violent Crimes Squad, and I, uh, I would like to acknowledge his efforts as well as Agents Bisworm and uh, David Bass. David Bass is a member of the FBI's Art Crimes Team. It was formed in 2005. There are 14 special agents across the country that are a member of that team, and we're very fortunate to have Agent Bass assigned to our division in Milwaukee. Uh, he's assigned to the lacrosse ra and it was his expertise that really led to how to handle this once it was recovered and turn it over safely to the victims so uh, again why is the fbi involved in in a case of this significance clearly the value plays into it but oftentimes in art crime th uh, cases or major theft cases it's a gateway to a larger criminal enterprise and oftentimes there are leads that go outside the city of milwaukee that's in fact what happened in this case. We pursued leads wherever they led us as quickly as they could lead us until we got to a successful resolution. The hard work at the end of the day rested with the Milwaukee Police Department and a handful of agents from the FBI office. Uh, but it was really that spirit of cooperation that allows us to stand before you today and tout this success. So with that, I'd like to turn things over to uh, Milwaukee Symphony Orchestra. Mark. Thank you. <clears throat> I'd like to echo all the comments of thanks to the Milwaukee Police Department as well as the FBI. Um, I stood at this podium uh, in somewhat of a surreal way a week ago, being very thankful that our concertmaster, Frank Almond, was healthy and um, was going to recover from his attack. Um, I was hopeful that I would be back here again, um, celebrating the return of the violin, and I'm very, very happy to be here. And our entire organization is incredibly thankful to the Milwaukee Police Department. We, as a um, performing arts organization, are not equipped to handle things like this. I have to give special recognition to Susan Loris, our Vice President of Marketing and Public Relations. She has done a yeoman's job in coordinating all the efforts with the police department, the FBI, and handling all the tips that came into this symphony. Um, it has been a, 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 an incredible week of communications on her end. and. Um, I want to thank especially the chief. He has been in communication with us often um, and has taken his own personal time, even late in the evenings, to make sure that we knew uh, the status of the investigation. So thank you, sir. Um, and I'm going to leave it at that. Thanks. Uh, we'll take some questions. Uh, first, uh, I want to assure all of you, uh, after we'll give you uh, an opportunity to uh, photograph the violin. We've got it in a secure location. Obviously, we don't want anybody to get too close to it, uh, but we'll set that up after this, uh, after this event. I'm sure you can understand why it's not on the table right now. Um, and uh, secondarily, uh, I'll answer questions. I suspect some of you are going to have more detailed information that may or may not be accurate than we are prepared to validate in this venue prior to a charging decision and prior to a prosecution. So, you know, please recognize that there are some things you may have that I'm not going to be prepared to uh, directly uh, confirm. Chief, when you're live on today's TMJ4, can you tell me about the residence where this violin was found? How was it connected to the suspects? Well, we uh, got the information about the residence from the suspect. He was able to identify it for us. It's our understanding that it was a friend of his who uh, owns the residence. Uh, it is also our understanding that the owner of that residence was unaware of the contents of the suitcase that his friend asked to leave there. But uh, that's all general at this point. But that's our uh, that's our preliminary understanding. Can you context, Chief? Just what, if you can, what was this plot this scheme that was played out at well, in a general sense, you know, we have not as yet, working with our federal partners, developed any information that indicates there was some scheme involving nefarious third parties of shadowy, you know, art crime organizations. At this point, it appears we had a local criminal who uh, very much had an interest in art theft and was smart enough to, uh, 
to uh, identify this as a valuable instrument and to formulate a plan to uh, create a robbery. Beyond that, we do not know what his motivation is, as I indicated yesterday. Mercifully, we don't have to prove motive in a criminal proceeding. We have to, you know, prove that the overt act took place in furtherance of a specific intent and that we're comfortable with. Well, as has been revealed, uh, he has a prior history as an art, th as an art thief and that uh, he uh, previously stole a valuable artifact, which he was able to uh, keep hidden for quite some period of time and then later on attempt to sell it. Whether or not that was his plan in this circumstance, we don't know. You say you went to five different locations for the search warrant, um, but it was last night that you got new information that took you to this East Smith location. What was it specifically that, you know, what changed um, in the course of your investigation overnight? Mr. Chisholm, you used the word negotiations three times as you were talking to us. Um, and so I guess what took you there and what does the, what did that in negotiation include? A question for you, Chief, and Mr. Chisholm. Certainly. Well, in a general sense, obviously, we have been uh, interviewing the uh, principals here over the last couple of days. And obviously, in the course of those interviews, we're looking uh, to get them to a place where they uh, are able to understand where their best interests lie. And clearly, uh, law enforcement and the community had a sincere interest in seeing this uh, priceless uh, artistic artifact return to its owners. And so clearly, that was going to inform the discussions and interviews as well. And in that regard, uh, clearly, the district attorney's office is a uh, crucial decision maker in terms of the direction those discussions will go. John? Sure. In answer to your question, um, a negotiated issuance is, is a type of discussion that often occurs uh, when we need information from the suspect. And the only way we're going to obtain that information is to discuss the range of possibilities of what that person could be charged with or what kind of recommendations. It's not appropriate at this point in time for me to discuss what those were. Um, the suspect was represented by counsel. Uh, we were able to discuss um, the, the range of possibilities. And um, based on that, we were able to get the information that led us directly uh, to the location of the violin. Did that negotiation include a, a plea of some deal that would result in a lesser charge for this individual, like giving up the information for the location of the violin? This isn't the appropriate time to, to discuss negotiations. Uh, again, uh, we'll have to wait until the official complaint is, is filed, and then uh, much of that information will be answered on public record. And how many do we expect to have charges against tomorrow, two or three? Um, at, at this point in time, I anticipate having a criminal complaint uh, ready for one person uh, tomorrow morning, uh, whether additional will come or not. I, I can't comment on that at this point in time. Have they been released from custody? It's been I, 72 I, hours, hasn't it? I, I don't know the answer to that. But there is some kind of clock ticking. There is. Typically? There so is. So when would that have run out? Um, I, I, I don't have that answer for you, Colleen, at this point in time. Do you know, Chief? Well, I'm whether these guys, I mean, you guys have 72 hours to Yeah, we're within, we're within the law. We've got expert legal advice. <laughs> but are they in custody still, the two? Uh, we've got two people that we're still, uh, we still have in custody, yeah. Will there be others? Any reason to believe that beyond these three people, anyone else might be charged or involved? We haven't got any information. That I, I don't have that. any information that. How do you anticipate that that $100,000 reward is going to be awarded? Uh, well, we're certainly going to share what knowledge we have with the uh, people that have offered the award. Um, I suspect that, uh, you know, we are going to forward to them, I don't suspect, I know we're going to forward to them the information we received from what private parties that were helpful. Certainly the information we received from the arrestee is not a candidate for the reward. Uh, but uh, obviously we got some information from private parties that uh, would probably, uh, I think, plausibly qualify them for consideration. And that's the information that we will share with the, uh, with the individuals offering the reward. How did you do? had a chance to inspect the violin, how does it look? Uh, I mean, not necessarily to your Well, I mean, I, I, think, uh, I think it looks pretty damn good for a 300-year-old. Doesn't look a day over 250, as far as I can tell. Any expert take a look at it yet? Uh, well, the, uh, you know, somebody folks have eyeballed it. Uh, they haven't brought in experts to look at it. Uh, the FBI, you know, uh, art crime team member handled it literally with kid gloves. So uh, it certainly looks good to us, but obviously, you know, we'll wait for Frank Allman to uh, hit a new few notes on it before we know for sure. But it looks has good. Seen it? Uh, he has seen photographs of it. He hasn't. He's not uh, in state right now. How Maybe you can tell us. Is he going to be playing it this weekend? No, I have talked to Frank. He's not. He's actually playing. Sorry. 
He's actually playing concerts in Florida right now. Um, as a musician, his life continues with or without the violin. Um, and he uh, is playing concerts in Florida right now. He'll be back in the next couple of days. No, he will not be on our stage this weekend. He was never scheduled to play this weekend. He will, however, be with us on Valentine's Day. So his, his, he's thrilled that the violin is back. Um, obviously, pictures can say a thousand words, um, and none of his words were, oh no, look at this scratch, it's broken or anything. It looks the way it's supposed to look. Um, the bridge is intact, the sound post is still up, um, and you know all the strings are there. So uh, we have pretty strong confidence that the violin is fine. Should I, I however, am not an expert. To play it, though, given this whole incident? You know, I can't speculate on that. That's going to be the, the choice for Frank to play this violin was between Frank and the owner of the violin. And um, these instruments must be played in order to live on. If you just put them in a case and leave them somewhere, they tend to deteriorate. So it's in the owner's best interest for the violin to be played. But it's not for me to speculate on what the circumstances are going to be about the, how the violin is in circulation or not. But that hasn't been decided yet? No, I don't think. I think we're all still in the thankful phase that we have the thing back. I do have behind me a number of people, however, who have volunteered to escort Frank around the world um, <laughs> to uh, make sure nothing happens to that violin. Can you talk about does, does the taser leave, each taser leave an individual imprint or something? Or can you discuss how the taser Oh, we don't want to give up too much tradecraft right now, but we do know that uh, if you know what you're doing, and we do, uh, there are ways to identify. Um, uh, ways to uh, trace uh, the use of this device. Chief, I guess my question, you got this violin last night, you know it's precious, you can't put it in the brown paper bag, how do you preserve it overnight here? Uh, well, we took you know, great pains to put it in a very, very safe place and to literally, I, you know, not, not literally kid gloves, but gloves, and uh, it was handled like a baby, all right, except we didn't powder it. Um, so it's very carefully taken care of. Uh, it's secured overnight. It, uh, we recovered, as you recall, the original case. So we were able to put it back in its original case and put both of those things in a, uh, in a extremely secure location. And as I say, after this event, you'll have an opportunity to photograph it. You'll see it in its case. We're not going to let you get too close to it, of course, but, uh, you know, you'll see it. Chief, could you talk for a minute? At the beginning, there was, you know, all kinds of international <coughs> Yeah, whatever. I mean, you talk a little bit about, I mean, this was a really big deal. This, this is a real big deal by any stretch of the imagination. Um, the target makes it a big deal. And uh, one thing we know, and one of the discussions we had very early on in the investigation is, on the one hand, okay, we've got an extraordinarily valuable piece of art stolen, okay? The hardest part for us is to slow down our imaginations. We have to go where the facts and information lead us. Cops, like everybody else, wanted to sit around over coffee and say, well, I bet it was this, I bet it was that, I bet it was the other. I mean, everybody has that speculation. But we can't start from the premise of, this is our speculation, can we get the facts to lead us there? We've got to follow the facts methodically. And one of the things I believe I said last week is we can't dismiss any possibility here. I mean, it could be two incredibly lucky criminals, it could be two garden variety criminals with a plan, it could be people that were hired to do something, it could be, a, it could be all of those things. Um, we couldn't settle on a theory. We had to settle on where the facts were leading us. And once we began to develop some information, we followed those facts to these individuals. And to be clear, without talking to this individual last night with this new information, did any of your tips that you received to the symphony or your department ever lead you to this Smith Street location, or was it simply... That was uh, the crucial piece was last night working closely with the DA's office. Can you talk about, was it a heated attic? Was it, like, was it wrapped in a blanket in the suitcase? Was it treated properly? Well, I, I would say in the realm of things that have been stolen, it was treated very carefully by the people that stole it. I mean, folks that stole it knew it was highly valuable. Uh, they knew they didn't want to do anything to injure its value. Now, they didn't have a violin case, but they had a suitcase, and they treated it gingerly. So that's why, to our untrained eyes, this uh, appears to us undamaged. They were being careful with it. Did you find the getaway van yet? We're still looking for that. Is there any indication they were trying to move this somewhere else? You mentioned a small market for resale on something like this. Yeah, we don't we don't have any indication of that. So as I say, what what the ultimate end game was, uh, I don't know that we'll know. But we have not developed any information that leads us to believe that there were uh, 
you know, shadowy figures in the international art theft world trying to uh, purchase this. So you did a lot of talking to this suspect, it appears, and he eventually popped up this address. Did he give you any insight into, I mean, you don't just steal it and I'm going to leave it in an attic for the rest of my life. Well, as I say, sometimes the, the best prediction of, uh, of uh, future behavior is past behavior. Um, as, you, uh, as you indicated before, this individual has uh, done fairly high-end art theft in the past, and the last time his plan was to keep it you know, in a safe place for a number of years and then try to bring it out of hiding and do something with it. So theoretically, it's plausible that that might have been his plan here, to keep it off the market and out of sight for a number of years and then maybe. But he hasn't uh, said. No, he hasn't, he hasn't shared that with us. Mayor Barrett, I understand aware. that you... How did he become aware that this valuable instrument was in the connoisseur? Well, I mean, he's, I, I would not go into enor enormous details. Suffice it to say, he did his homework. Mayor Barrett, I understand that you had an interaction of something with one of the suspects. Can you elaborate on what that all entailed with universal Allah knowledge? Sure. I, uh, my staff uh, informed me yesterday that there was a picture on his Facebook page um, of him cutting my hair. And what had happened was, Last August 17th, I was in the community and I was visiting a community event and spontaneously, as I often do, I decided to stop in at the barbershop to say hello to the patrons and the people who work there. And while I was there, they said, hey, do you want to get your haircut? Uh, and as a matter of fact, they needed a haircut. Uh, and I said, sure. So I sat down in the chair and he, with the assistance of a couple other people, cut my hair um, and he wanted to have a picture. I'm sitting in the, in the chair with the white sheet around me. Uh, and and uh, getting my hair cut. I, I didn't suspect anything, although I, I did think it was odd that there was violin resin all over the place. Uh, no, just kidding there. Uh, <laughs> um, so it was just, a, it was a chance encounter and it happens oftentimes when I'm in the community. And I'm, it, it shows that even when the cameras aren't around, I'm in the community. And Chief, could you explain what Mr. Allah's role is? I, I'm still a little confused about what his role yeah, uh, well, you know, obviously this will inform the charging decisions at well, but at this point in time, our indications are that he's the one that provided the weapon to the suspect who committed the robbery. And then the, what, why was the woman arrested? Well, our understanding was that she was uh, at the scene at the, of the crime driving the vehicle. And she may not be charged, is that what Well, you know, again, that's all part of the ongoing uh, investigation and, uh, and interviews, so as the facts finally play out as to her role, the appropriate decision will be made. Okay, you guys can coordinate with me for the Thank you, gentlemen and ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.